Okay, I think it's eight o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and start the presentation and start the recording. I'm Victoria Russell, and I am the actual president for 2022. I'm also a professor of Spanish and language education at Valdosta State University, and that's located in Southern Georgia. I'm coming to you today, though, however, from Tampa, Florida. It is my spring break week, and so now I'm in Florida today. So uh, with me also helping out in this session is Executive Director of Actful, Howie Berman. You can wave hello. He is helping me out with all of the technology, and he's going to be advancing the slides. And uh, so anyway, to this uh, session, I want to thank uh, PNCFL. I am so delighted to be with you here, and I'm so excited for your organization. Now that you have a new executive director, Bridget Yaden, who is a past president of Actful, and Catherine Oslin as your president, you are just a wonderful organization, and I'm happy to be with you here today. So before we advance the next slide, I want everyone to think about the title of this presentation, Teach Communicatively from Research and Theory to Practice. I bet if I asked every single person in this room, do you use either communicative language teaching or communicative approaches to language teaching? I bet every single person would say yes. But what is the reason that, what is the purpose of communicative language teaching? How could you advance the slide? And we're going to take a look at the purpose. The end result is that we want our students to attain something called communicative competence. That's what is required to really learn a, another language. It, you have to have three different types of competencies in order to acquire communicative competence. We have grammatical competence, sociolinguistic competence, and strategic competence. A lot of teachers, unfortunately, especially my novice teachers, I train uh, word language teachers, and they really get stuck on that grammatical competence. And it's difficult for them to move beyond. But think of it as a stool that has three legs. In order to really be able to speak another language and to interact with native speakers and to understand them and, and to have conversations with them and to understand the culture, we need to build all three of these competencies. And we're gonna unpack each one. And then I'm going to share with you some ways to teach, uh, to help your learners build these three distinct uh, competencies. So uh, let's go ahead and advance the slide. We're going to take a, a first look at grammatical competence. This is just a reflection question for you to think about. How much time should world language teachers spend teaching grammar and how should grammar be taught? Uh, last year, uh, one of my doctoral students, she uh, delivered a survey to all the world language teachers in Georgia. And we found that about 75% of the time they were reporting, where language teachers were reporting that they were spending that much time teaching grammar and vocabulary. So that's a lot of the time. So let's think about how much time you might spend teaching grammar. And when we do teach grammar, what are some good ways to do so? I'm going to be sharing with you two ways that I advocate when you need to teach grammar. I believe grammar should be only taught to support communication. So when there's a communication breakdown or students need specific forms and structures so they can engage in a communicative activity. Um, however, there are two uh, techniques that we're going to talk about tonight, processing instruction and the PACE model. These are research-based techniques that allow learners to, um, they look at grammar as a concept and using it in context. So the main thing about these two techniques is that they focus on meaning over form. Meaning is the focus of instruction. So let's take a look at the next slide. Processing instruction is a technique that is based on Bill Van Patten's model of input processing. It is a input-based technique. Um, I'm not sure if anyone in here is familiar with processing instruction. Most teachers that I've spoken with when I've uh, attended all the various regional conferences thus far, most teachers have never heard of processing instruction. It comes out of Van Patten's model of input processing, which is a set of 
uh, strategies, it's flawed strategies that learners tend to engage in when they're initially processing their input. Let me give you an example of that, of a flawed strategy. So many people here might teach a romance language like Spanish or French. With Spanish, for example, it's a pro drop language, meaning that you can, the, 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 the subject pronoun is often dropped in the sentence, it's not there. So the word in the sentence initial position is um, oftentimes going to be an object pronoun. So according to Van Patten's model, um, uh, students are going to process the first word that they see in a sentence or read or hear as the subject of the sentence. And that is going to cause communication breakdowns, delays in the acquisition process. So um, processing instruction is designed to help uh, learners circumvent those flawed input processing strategies in favor of more optimal ones. I especially love it because it's input-based and learners are, um, they're building an implicit linguistic system. They are uh, focusing on form and meaning simultaneously. And the purpose of processing instruction is to help learners make a correct form meaning connection. That's the connection between a grammatical form and the meaning that it encodes. Unfortunately, processing instruction is only amenable to structures that carry meaning. I'm gonna show you some examples of that, of structures that carry meaning and others that don't. And Van Patten suggests that you should use processing instruction when you anticipate a processing problem. So it's considered an instructional technique rather than a method. A method is something you can use every day to teach every type of structure, every type of form, but processing instruction because those targeted forms have to carry meaning, it's not amenable to all structures. So for example, in Spanish and in French, um, in all Romance languages, definite articles are only conveying grammatical information. So in Spanish, el, la, los, and las, they all mean the, T-H-E, the, 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 but um, it's only gonna convey that information is, is the word masculine, feminine, singular, plural. So that's not, it's not meaning-based. Let's go ahead to the next slide. Processing instruction has three components. Uh, students are given an explicit explanation of grammar, but that explanation is not paradigmatic, meaning that you only teach your students one form or structure at a time. Oftentimes when you open up a, a textbook, it will give students, if you're learning, say, um, verb conjugations for stem changing verbs, it will give them all six forms, first person, second, third, first person, singular, plural, so forth. And with processing instruction, nope, let's focus on one form. Let's focus on maybe just the first person, or we'll focus only on the third person. And you build them up little by little, one form at a time. The second um, component is information on processing strategies. So I told you about that students are going to want to process the first word that they hear or see in the sentence as the subject of the sentence. Well, processing instruction will give students that information up front. They'll say, hang on a second, you got to be careful here. When you see this sentence, remember the first word may not be the subject of that sentence. In Spanish, you need to look at that verb ending to determine who is your subject. So you're giving them that explicit information to help them avoid that faulty input processing. The second part is to create structured input activities. These are those activities that force learners to make a form meaning connection. So looking at my example here, Last week, I worked 60 hours. So the word last week, those are called, that's a lexical item to remove any kind of redundancies in the sentence that indicate past tense. Last week, that's the first thing students are going to process. And okay, last week, that gives us the past. We want to take that out of the sentence to force students to focus on the ED. The ED is the grammatical form. That's a bound inflectional morpheme in English. I'll show you that it carries meaning. ED, that means past. I worked, I studied, I traveled. All of that, that ED is conveying the past tense meaning. So we want to create activities that force learners to notice 
that ED and to process it correctly. So I'm gonna share with you two examples of structured input activities, one in English and one in Spanish. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. So this is an example of a structured input activity in English. And I'm talking about Heather Sweetser. She's our actual teacher of the year. And uh, so we're taking a look at all the things that Heather did last week. So my English learners will have to check off all of the sentences that are in the past. But the only thing that's telling them that it's a past tense is that bound inflectional morpheme. So looking at the sentence, how we and Heather walked to school in the snow. There's nothing else in that sentence that conveys the past except for that ED. So it's forcing students to notice the targeted form and to make that form meaning connection. Lucas and Heather studied math. Again, that's the past tense. Heather sometimes works at McDonald's. Believe it or not, for English learners, that third person S is the last acquired morpheme in the English language. That's very hard for English learners. So if I have, if my neighbor um, is English learner, she might say, my husband worked at the university instead of works. We understand that, but that's a very late acquired feature and difficult for English learners. Celia and Heather watched their favorite show and Heather and her friend, oh, it looks like I can't see the last sentence, I've got the chat box up. Heather and her friend, and I think Heather's here, ride their bikes to the park. So that's an example in English. Let's take a look at an example in Spanish. All right, so remember part of processing instruction is to alert students to those uh, flawed strategies. So that first noun principle, we wanna remind them, ojo, remember that in Spanish, the first word that you see in a sentence may not be the subject of the sentence. You'll notice with the structured input activity in Spanish, all of the input is in the target language. So the, the learners are working with their input their brain is doing the work and we're, we're helping them make these correct four meaning connections. So, elige el sujeto de la oración subrayada. Uh, choose the subject of the underlined sentence. So, David está en la esquina. David is on the corner. Lo ve María. So your students, what they tend to do when, when they're learning a language, lo ve María, they're going to wanna to process that lo as the subject of the sentence. And really it's the object. You have to read it backwards in Spanish for it to make sense. Maria sees him. Now in Spanish, it's even more difficult. Not only can you drop the subject, but word order is more fluid. So English is subject, verb, object. It doesn't change, subject, verb, object. Spanish is subject, object, verb, but can also be object, verb, subject, like you see here. So lo ve Maria, quien ve a David? Who sees David? And of course, the answer is Maria. So next sentence, this is even more complicated. Uh, la tarta parece sabrosa. La pedimos al camarero. ¿Quién pide el postre? So the pie looks delicious. We order it from him. Who is him? The waiter. We order it from him, from the waiter. So in Spanish, it would have been le, but you can't put le in la, so le changes to se. And when students see say, they get very confused about who the subject is. So reminding your students that they need to look at the verb ending to see who the subject is. Pedimos is the nosotros form. Quien pide el postre? Nosotros. When your students first do activities like this, it's going to be challenging for them. But over time, they're going to start making those correct four meaning connections. And it helps them learn very complex grammar like double object pronouns in Spanish. Last one, los libros pesan mucho. The books weigh a lot. Los lleva José. José carries them. Again, if you read the sentence backwards, but los is in that sentence initial position and it is the direct object. José carries them. ¿Quién lleva los libros? José. So that's a, an example of processing instruction, which is a great to teach grammar whenever you are teaching grammar because it's not only a research-based approach, but the focus is on meaning and form simultaneously. Let's take a look at the next slide. Another great way to teach grammar if you're going to be teaching grammar is to use the PACE model by Gleason and 
And by the way, at the end of this presentation, I have a slide with all of these resources. So if you want to learn more about processing instruction, if you want to learn more about the PACE model, you'll be able to do that by looking at that slide that has all those resources on it. So um, according to PACE, we have presentation, attention, co-construction, and attend extension. So um, the best way to, to work with the PACE model is to find an authentic text that is flooded with the targeted form that you want to teach. So say I want to teach um, the past tense in Spanish or in French. Well, in Spanish and French, we have two simple pasts. We have in Spanish, the preterito and the imperfecto. And in French, it's the passé composé and the imperfait. And it's very difficult for English speakers to distinguish uh, because you're looking at tense and aspect, it's very difficult for them to distinguish those two different types of past tenses when in English we only have one simple past. So you'll find a, a resource um, and we'd like to use with the PACE model, we like to use authentic resources. Those are materials that are created by and or for native speakers of the language. And so you'll find something in the past tense, maybe it's a, a fairy tale or some other short story or even a newspaper clipping that's narrated in the past. And the, the teacher will present that text to the students with a focus on meaning. At that point, they're not even focusing on those preterite versus imperfect contrast. They're just looking at what does this text mean? In the second phase, then the teacher is going to direct their attention. Okay, we've read this text once. We understand what it means, but let's take a look at these different forms, these preterite and imperfect forms that appear in the text. And here's where you can use visual input enhancement. You can highlight the targeted forms. You can change the font style or size. You can underline it. Anything to draw the student's attention to, okay, I understand what this text means, but now let me see if I can figure out what, you know, how these two different past tenses are being used. At part three, phase three, is the co-construction phase. <coughs> That's where the students are trying to figure out the grammar rule or explanation, but it's important that they get scaffolding or assistance from the teacher, because you all know as language teachers, students can come up with some flawed thinking. They can come up with some ideas that aren't correct. So it's up to the teacher to scaffold and provide assistance to make sure that what the, the the rules that students are figuring out are actually accurate. And then in the extension phase, the students are actually using the grammar that they just learned through the PACE model to complete a task. So they're, then they're producing output. So that's the PACE model in a nutshell. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Here, I want us to take a couple of minutes to look at these reflection questions. I want each of you in here to take about four minutes to read these questions and then to put your responses in the chat. And then I'm gonna share a couple of your responses out to the whole group. So I'm gonna give you about four minutes uh, to read and, and put your responses in, and then we'll come back together and I'll share some of those out with the main group.
Okay, one more minute to get your responses in. And we're not such a big group, so I can probably call on you if you want to share um, as well with um, your microphone. We're not too big of a group. I see some excellent comments in here. Um, Kate, do you want to share with us? Um, you had written some nice, some good information here in the chat about what you're doing in your class. Uh, let's see, which one? I forget already what I wrote. <laughs> we have such a limited time with only three hours right. a week. Yeah. Yeah, so I have actually been struggling with this a lot because I teach at MSU and we only have three hours a week and not even three minutes each time and students come in and they want grammar so much and so this semester I kind of swayed that direction and it was awful like it just didn't work at all so um hang on a second so I really like try to keep keep the class doing content during the class time because I find when we when we switch to grammar instruction that I end up speaking too much English and that's not useful for them at all and that's really like the thing that happened just like right before break, like they want grammar. And so then we end up talking about grammar and English and that's not what I wanna do. Like I wanna read texts, I wanna talk about texts. I want to like, you know, do creative things that are fun with the language and have them communicate with each other. And that's the direction that we're gonna go after break <laughs> more. You thought about using that PACE model I described since you talked about- Yeah, what and text. actually I use the PACE model, it turns out. Um, I, you know, I didn't realize what, I mean, I've heard about it um, numerous times. So now that you like re-mentioned it to me, I'm like, oh yeah, that's what I do. Like we just did fairy tale. We did Aschenpudel in German and yeah, read the fairy tale and then, you know, really focused on meaning and like, you know, working with the vocab and how can we retell it and how can we tell it differently? And then like worked on the grammar part um, and like picked out a few things. Um, and and had you say I'm sorry, you say your students want grammar? Do, is they that because do, it's, it's on their tests or is it in their activities or why are they learning grammar? I don't even do tests, um, but oh, I had a student at the, and he had me last semester and he like, the third day of class, he was like almost in tears. He's like, I just want you to teach us how to do like dative and accusative. And I'm like, oh God, really? <laughs> yeah. And then right. I had a student cry at a quiz and I was like, no, this is not my class. I don't do this. <laughs> it's like, it could be what they're used to from the schools they're coming from as well. And that may, makes them feel, you know, more comfortable. Right. Thanks for know. sharing. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> no. My school teachers are amazing, by the way. Are, um, our students are. are coming from Washington. Yeah. They're like outstanding. They are. They are. But yeah. my novice teacher, I train teachers. And so my new teachers, um, the not, you know, they're, they're struggling. So it's easier for them to grab onto the grammar and it's easier yes. for them to follow the book and I have to push them. So with novice teachers, I find them struggling in that way, but not our seasoned teachers. You're right. Um, mm -hmm. So Paris, I, I'd like to hear what you have to say about using instruction. That's very interesting that you're, you're using it. Um, yeah. I had to do, I don't know, I'm not in the classroom much anymore, but there's a substitute teacher shortage I'm sure you've heard about, right? Yes. Um, so I took over a class that had been abandoned back in November. I took it over for two months in January and February. So I was really trying to, you know, take some of the, you know, the processing instruction because it was Spanish and, you know, really trying to work on it. And I felt like I really wanted feedback on my practice because I, once I got into the weeds of it, I wasn't sure I was doing it right. So I was hoping that we could like, if we had like a, a support group around the US, because I know like the textbooks don't really have this in it, right? Um, even the best ones. So I did try it out. I was trying to get them to focus on the meaning because the only word they could use was the verb to get to the meaning, right? But, um, and it worked for my strongest students, but I just, I, I would really love more examples. I'd love to hear what other people are doing with it. Because I think we're onto something there. I really like the idea of it only being input. So I'm not expecting them to output it perfectly. 
Um, but the, especially like for some of those, the input, like I have to understand it. Like, that's what I want to know. Cause like, if I'm trying to read Spanish and there's all these missing pronouns, like I won't understand it. <laughs> otherwise. Well, Paris, you got me thinking about something related to research, you know, um, even though processing instruction is input based, do you know that students who are exposed to processing instruction only perform equally well on output activities as students who were exposed output based instruction. So it's very effective because they're actually building their internal grammars and then they're able to use it just like a baby when they're learning their first language. They're building that in internal uh, grammar. Well, and so, they like that it's meaning based. Like they yes. want to focus on meaning. So it's motivating for them. But I would, I'm so excited to hear you talk about this. I, I will definitely look forward to future work on this. Well, you gave me a great idea to share with everybody. And this is going to be our presentation tomorrow. But ACTL has a new platform rolling out in April called Parent Share. And that's where people can get together and work on a project or learn a new skill. So if, for example, I listed processing instruction under my name, you could pair up with me and then we could create activities together since you teach Spanish, because the activities take a lot of time to create. So that's, that's a great idea. Well, thank you so much. We don't have any more time, but there's some great comments. Of course, Heather, our teacher of the year is amazing, only teaching 5% of grammar. Bridget doing the flipped classroom, which I think is ideal. Uh, if you're able to have students uh, practice that grammar at home and learn that at home um, with the flip model, they generally, you have um, instructional videos and content that students are working through at home. And then they come to you and you're actually communicating. So that, that's beautiful. So please read all of those comments. We do, we do need to move on those. So we, we've uh, run out of time for the grammar part. I want to get to my favorite part to talk about is pragmatic competence. So we, remembering the three prongs to, for your students to attain communicative competence, grammatical competence is only one prong. And as I said, my new teachers focus way too much on that. Uh, the second prong is sociolinguistic competence, and that's comprised of pragmatic competence and discourse competence. And I'm going to confess something to you. Um, but um, elementary, middle, and high school, mostly middle and high school Spanish, before I, and also community college, before I went back to get my PhD. And I was like a very new PhD student and I went to a graduate uh, research symposium and I heard another graduate student doing a presentation on pragmatics. And I sat there the whole presentation and here I've been teaching 15 years and I, what is she talking about? I had never heard of it. And I was like, what is this? And then when I found out what pragmatics is, I thought, oh my goodness, this is what, this is what we should be focusing on in a language class. Uh, so pragmatics is how language is used by native speakers in everyday situations. And I don't know if you've ever had the experience like I have where I've sat on a plane next to somebody and they say, what do you do? They say, well, I'm a Spanish teacher. And they'll say, oh, I took Spanish for four years and I can't say a word or I can't understand it when people speak to me. My students used to say that, oh my goodness, I can understand you, but it's so hard to understand. This is before I got the PhD and I was teaching using just the book resources. Now I know how to help my students to build that pragmatic competence so that they can understand the language as it's spoken in its natural social and cultural context. It's beautiful to teach prag pragmatics too, because it's where language and culture meet. It's the cultural aspects of language and students find that fascinating, it's motivating for them. And it's also important to teach pragmatics so that they can build relationships with members of the target language culture. So gra grammatical errors are really easy to recognize and notice and forgive. So if your neighbor says, oh, my husband, he work at the university, you know that your neighbor meant to say works and it's not a big deal and you just get over it because it's just a simple grammatical error. But pragmatic errors are often interpreted as rudeness. And let me give you an example. I had the great fortune to be able to teach Spanish in England for three years. And I taught at a regional college. And so my students were like 16 to adult. And my department head was a French teacher. And she let me sit in on her French conversation classes. I'd always wanted to learn and master French. 
And so I learned from her that it's really important when you um, travel to a French speaking country, especially France, um, that you need to greet the shopkeeper. So just a simple bonjour, and then you can ask for what you need. But um, with my first trip to Paris, I remember that. And I went, I went into stores asking for help, but I always said bonjour. And uh, I got lots of help and people were awfully friendly. But I saw a lot of people from the United States and they would just walk into a store and say, how much is this? How much is this? And the shopkeeper would not want to help them. What? You don't even greet me? This bonjour is so important to greet them them that human dignity of a greeting. So the French shopkeeper would not want to help the person who didn't bother to greet them. And then the US, uh, the person from the United States would be like, why, why don't they want to help me? I just want to buy this phone. And so there's that pragmatic breakdown happening right there. And just because the, the people from the United States didn't know the importance of the greeting. So we kind of understand a little bit here what is pragmatics It's how language is used in its natural and social context given specific speakers and settings. But how do we actually teach pragmatics let's take a look at the next slide. We can teach pragmatics by teaching our students speech acts. These are universal functions that are common across languages, such as greetings and farewells and making requests and apologizing and thanking and complimenting and complaining. Now, while these functions are universal, how they are realized are going to vary greatly by language and culture. So let me give you an example in Spanish <clears throat> and in English. I've been married for 32 years. And at dinner, if I want uh, the salt, I will say to my husband, could you please pass me the salt? So could you, that's an ability question. I'm being very polite. And I use the politeness marker, please, could you, would you? This is how we form requests by and large in English. We use that politeness marker. We use the conditional, right? We use the ability question, can you, could you? But in Spanish, they're much more direct in their request strategies. And most of the time, they're going to use a command for a request. Pásame la sal. Pass me the salt. Without the politeness marker, please. So I have a study abroad program in Southern Spain, and I have to tell my students that because they often interpret the host family as being very rude or gruff because they're using this request strategy that is very direct compared to our request strategy in English of the can you, could you, using that command. So we can teach our students the speech acts. And I love to help students do this by using open educational resources and videos. I'm gonna share with you in just a moment some of these uh, resources, but I wanna point out the last bullet point on this, why it's so difficult to learn pragmatics. Uh, our students have difficulty forming speech acts because they, not, they need to not only know the language, but also the appropriate use of the language. So how do we teach our, our students to be appropriate in the target language culture? Let's take a look at the next slide. I love to use a resource called Lang Media. This was this resource um, was uh, created with federal grant funding from the Five College Center for the Study of World Languages. They're totally open access videos. And what's beautiful is that they have resources for over 50 languages. And for Spanish and French, they have videos from different countries that speak the language. So you can show your students those uh, differences in colloquial expressions, vocabulary, accents, and so forth. So this is a very rich resource. I personally could not teach Spanish now without Lang Media because I really enjoy showing my students how the language is, is spoken in its natural social and cultural context. Also, many of our textbooks don't include things like using the phone. How do you use the telephone? How do you grocery shop? Posting a letter, visiting the hair salon. I moved to Spain in 1996 and no one ever taught me the vocabulary. I'm not a native speaker. No one taught me the vocabulary of the hair salon. And I, I wear bangs and I didn't know the word for bangs. 
and um, I got a really bad haircut. I came out looking like Spock. And <laughs> now I know the word flecado or flequicho, but I wish I had these videos before I moved to Spain. But I want to share with you um, one of the speed taxes greeting. And on the video that, that Howie is going to play in just a moment, it shows you two native speakers in Southern Spain or first language speakers of Spanish interacting and greeting each other on the street. And this sounds very different than any kind of greeting I've ever had with any kind of textbook materials. Um, this is how the language really sounds. And we need to let our students know what the language sounds like. And we need to help them understand how this language sounds. And I've got, I'm gonna go ahead and play the video. And then on the next slide, I'm gonna show you how we can actually help our students understand what they're hearing. So go ahead, Howie. ¿Qué pasa? Nada. ¿Y ¿Qué tal? Muy bien, aquí de vacaciones. Yo en el camping estoy, ahí arriba. ¿Sí? Sí. Ah, pues yo me voy de compras a ver si veo alguna camiseta. Venga, esta. pues a ver si nos vemos por ahí. Vale. Venga. Venga. Hasta luego. Ok, that's how they sound in southern Spain. I take, um, you know, I have my study abroad program and I always take my uh, students who are training to be Spanish teachers and they have reached a very high level of their Spanish proficiency if they're not um, a first language speaker of Spanish. I'm telling you every day, two or three students on the first day of classes run out of the room crying because they thought they understood Spanish. And then all of a sudden they're hearing it sound like that. <laughs> so how do we help our students understand the language as it's really spoken? Let's take a look at the next slide. The beautiful thing about Lang Media is that you have the transcripts. So you see everything is written out in Spanish and then you have the English translation. So you can go over these transcripts with your students first, have them read along and listen. That will help them build their listening skills. Looking at the English as well, especially if they're novice learners and they're learning a greeting, that's very challenging for them what you just heard. Now, I remember being a novice Spanish teacher and I'm not a, a first language speaker of Spanish. I used to be frightened to play clips for my students if there was a word I didn't know, if there was an expression I wasn't familiar with. And of course, looking at all the different ways that speak Spanish, there's no way I could possibly know all of the different colloquial expressions, but teachers don't have to worry about that because you have the translation right there. So I would have the students look at the Spanish transcript, read it together, play the video several times, letting them read it over and over again. And as you do this, you know, day after day, doing a little bit every day with some videos of native speakers, believe it or not, they do start to understand how the language really sounds. Let's take a look at the next slide. This shows all the different languages that where videos are available with Lang Media. So whether you're teaching a less commonly taught language or commonly taught language, there's going to be, there are going to be videos that you can use. Let's take a look at the next one. And this is kind of cut off. This is just like the half of the page of all the different types of videos they have. Um, but whatever you happen to be teaching, chances are you're gonna be able to find some kind of video that you can play with native speakers interacting on that topic in the target language. So again, I said, I couldn't teach Spanish without this because I know now how important it is to teach pragmatics to my students. All right, let's take a look at the next slide. We're going to move on now to discourse competence. I can't believe it's 839 already. The time just flies. Discourse competence is the next competency together, pragmatic competence and discourse competence uh, for sociolinguistic competence. And discourse competence is all about those joining together skills, cohesion and coherence. So the ability to link related words and sentences and the ability to make sense out of related words, phrases, and sentences. It's very hard for our students to uh, have a production that is cohe that's cohesive and coherent because they uh, tend to engage in relaxification. I'm really sorry if you hear the music. I, I, it's, I'm in a downtown area. And so uh, if you hear a little faint music playing that uh, is I, I can't, I can't help that. But anyway, what learners do is they engage in something called relaxification. That's where they are plugging in. Um, they take the first language syntax 
to plug in second language vocabulary. All of you have read essays from students and you're like, oh my goodness, what are they trying to say? And that's what they're doing, that first language syntax and that second language vocabulary. And so we need to teach them these skills of cohesion and coherence. And these are just a, a few simple activity ideas I'm gonna share with you to help my students learn discourse competence. One is a passage reassembly task. Again, I love using those authentic materials. Those are materials made by and or for native speakers of the language. So I might take a newspaper clipping and say it has five paragraphs. I'm gonna cut those up and have the students place them in the correct order. Sentence combination task is the same thing. You have a long sentence, you cut up the words and then you have the students placing the sentence in the correct order. You can have them perform an operation on a text. So again, take that authentic newspaper article and say it's written in the past tense. You might have them uh, change it to the present or to the future. Or if it's written in the third person, have them write it in the first person. So they're working with those authentic materials and they're performing these operations on the text and hopefully noticing how words, phrases, and sentences are joined together. Close activities are also good, again, taking that authentic text and blanking out every fifth word. That word might be a verb, it might be a noun, it might be an article. Now, when you have a close activity, you have to be aware that many, there are many things that could fit in that blank. So you have to, it takes a little longer to grade those because you have to look and think, okay, does that word make sense? Uh, and then of course the pace model, Another great way to teach discourse competence because uh, learners are working with authentic texts. Let's take a look at the next slide. The next prong on uh, the le next leg on our stool of communicative competence is strategic competence. These are the communication strategies that we use to keep the conversation going with first language speakers of the language. Teach Student circumlocution, how to talk around the word. Understanding that word coinage is something that is that all language learners engage in and we should actually encourage it. So for example, if someone doesn't know the word balloon, they might say air ball, and they're pointing to a red balloon. Um, when I took my students to Spain, I had a young man, he had traveler's diarrhea and he didn't know the word. He was in class, he raised his hand and said, tengo mierda rapida. Those of you that speak Spanish know what that means. It's not very pretty, but he got the point across by coining that. Um, using gesture, these are the specific hand and body motions that convey meaning. Everything's A-OK -okay in English. We, do the, we can do the thumbs up. In Spanish, in Spain, if you tap your elbow, codo, if you tap your elbow, that means someone is cheap, tacaño. So teach students these um, gestures can help them keep conversations going when they don't know the word. And back channeling cues. So, you know, how do we in, indicate that we're listening to a conversation? If I'm listening to Bridget I, I, and she's talking, I might say, oh, hmm, oh, yes, interesting. Well, how do we teach our students those back channeling cues in Spanish? Uh, in Spain, it's vale, ah, sí, vale. And so teaching them that can hit, help that conversation keep flowing when they're interacting with first language speakers. And then some activities, some games you can play. Um, the pyramid game is that basically, I, to me, it's the same as taboo, where you would make a card and there's a word on the card that uh, you have two students in pairs and the words say it's horse. And then there's a bunch of other words that you can't, that the, the student can't say like barn or tail or hooves and they have to convey the word horse and have the other student guess it um, without using those buzzwords. And that is a great way to help teach your students circumlocution. So again, we had the grammatical competence, the uh, sociolinguistic and the strategic. So we need it when we're teaching and designing our lessons, we wanna make sure to give students opportunities to build all three types of those competencies. Let's take a look at the next slide. We have a short reflection activity here. I think we're only gonna spend maybe about two or three minutes on this one because I have more things I wanna share with you. Um, so we looked at these three types of competencies and I want you to share your ideas with the group. How do you help your students build these competencies? So if you have a, 
a great activity idea or something you do to help your students build one of these competencies. I'm going to give you about a minute and a half or so to put that idea in the chat and then we'll share uh, those with the whole group. Okay, I see some excellent activity ideas in here. I'm gonna steal them all. A silent auction. Um, oh my goodness, there were so many up here. Let's see, salad bowl. Kate, what? tell us what that is. This was a really fun game that we did this summer. Um, each student writes five words or it can be nouns, people, and I even put in verbs. So just on a card, they put one word on a card and they do five of them. And you put it all in, they fold them, you put them into a salad bowl. And in the first round, they pull out words and they're in two teams and they have to describe the word without saying it. And so then they guess and you do points. And then you put all the words back in the bowl and you do second round. The second round, they can only describe the word with one word. No, yeah, with one word. So, so then they've all heard the words one time. And so then you do that with teams and you put them all back in the bowl. Then the third round, you only can do words, um, no words at all. So it's like three rounds um, getting smaller and smaller and smaller with what you can say. It works out really great. Kids remember all the words. That's amazing. And you know, when you're teaching those gestures as well, you're teaching pragmatic competence, you're teaching um, strategic competence. That's an amazing activity because you're helping the students build those other competencies. That's amazing. Um, let's see what, what, what else was in here. Silent auction. Um, let's see, so people were trying to think of a name. Intercultural can do's. We non game from France. Oh, PNCFL board was, who's that? Was that Catherine? It is me, sorry, I didn't change my name. Tell us, tell us, what is that? It is a quite great, it's like taboo. It's a circumlocution game. And so there is a, a, um, a, a packet of cards and there's 10 questions that you have to ask your partner and you have to do it rapidly. So it's a little bit challenging for the novices, but the intermediate kids do very well. So it says, you like cheese, right? And you can't say yes or no. Oh. So you have to say, I agree with you. I think that's a great idea. You are right. You know, you have to find other expressions to show that you understood the question and that you can give your answer back to it. And since you do it fast, of course, then people trip up and say, yes, oh, I, I mean, I mean, you know, and it's, it's a great fun game and they have different themes. So it's been um, watching my students grow in their, you know, their add-ons, their extras, their reactions has been outstanding. That's wonderful. So they're learning several different competencies there with that as well. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Catherine. And then I'm going to ask Heather quickly to share about the Easter eggs, and then we're going to have to move on. Oh, sure. So uh, Easter eggs are something that gamers like to look for, like secrets and games and stuff. So we brought that into the language classroom, like what's the hidden Easter egg in this video or that kind of thing. Um, and the students love picking them up. Because sometimes we we show a lot of you know best practices, more people doing right, and then we want to mimic what's right. But students get a kick out of mimicking what's wrong and trying to like sneak that into their then you know um, 
conversations or something like this. And then people tend to listen to other conversations as well, really, really closely, because they want to find out what they, you know, it gets everybody paying attention instead of just the, okay, I've said my part, now I can relax. So this has been really helpful for us. That sounds great. A great way to motivate the students and to keep them engaged with the target language. That's awesome. Okay, Howie, I think we're ready for the next slide. So the next part of the presentation, I can't believe we only have 10 minutes left. I wanna focus on intercultural communicative competence or ICC. It's the ability to understand cultures, including your own, and to use this understanding to communicate with people from other cultures successfully. One definition I like that is from the British Council, but there's another definition I like even more. Byram claimed that speakers who possess ICC not only attempt to gain an inside view of another's culture, they also attempt to understand their own culture from an alternate cultural perspective. As a director of study abroad, this is the greatest thing you can give your students when you take them out of the country. They get to see how the United States is portrayed in media, in music, in movies, it just in every aspect of life. And it, it gives them a deeper sense of the target language culture when they can see their own culture from the perspective of other. Let's take a look at the next slide. So um, I'm borrowing from a past president of TESOL, Soon. She said effective ICC requires empathy, respect, tolerance, sensitivity, and flexibility. And I personally believe as we need this in our world now more than ever. If your students are, most of our students, let's face it, are not going to be native-like competence in the target language. And many times uh, teachers, uh, they're teaching first level, second level, their proficiency levels of the students are quite low when they're finished with two years of language instruction. But they can leave our classes attaining intercultural communicative competence. And I think this is the most important thing we do as language educators. Let's take a look at the next slide. All right, so I want to just remind us of the world readiness standards. So we have the communication is our first standard. And most of the time we're focusing on that. We got three modes of communication. We have a lot to do. We have four skills, three modes. But I want to remind you that when we're teaching, when we, when we bring in these other standards, cultures, connections, comparisons, communities, that's when we're really helping our students develop that ICC. And I'm going to share with you two ways that I have helped my students develop ICC, especially during the pandemic. My study abroad program was canceled the past two summers. So I created a virtual language exchange where my students were paired up with partners from the University of Cadiz, where we normally travel. Howie, let's take a look at that next slide. So this is a really powerful way to connect students to the target language community, that community standard. Um, they communicated 50% of the time in the target language and 50% of the time in English. I did provide guiding topics um, to ensure that students maximize their linguistic and cultural exposure. If you have the capability to record and store the conversations, please do that because when students go back and reflect and listen to the conversation again, it's very powerful. Let's take a look at the next slide. So again, I told you it's between my university, the host institution where I normally travel in the summer is located in Southern Spain. This was a, an intensive eight week college level summer course. It was, um, it was most of the students were in their third or fourth semester of college level Spanish. So they were intermediate, uh, high around intermediate high. Some even had reached advanced low by that stage. Um, I used the technology that was available to me, which was Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. I sent guest links to their partners. I used my um, connections to the University of Cadiz. My colleagues helped me set up the partners. If you don't have connections to, um, uh, to uh, faculty outside the United States. I have a slide towards the end of the presentation that shows you websites where you can go and, and, and locate other teachers and um, uh, other students who want to get involved in a language exchange. So even if you don't know anybody, you can still do this. Um, I make my students um, practice with the topic for the two weeks prior to each, co each conversation. So they had presentational reading activities on the topic, 
uh, listening, interpretive listening. They had to engage in presentational speaking and writing on the topic as well. Presentational, of course, they have time to plan and rehearse so that when they came time for the actual conversation, they could actually uh, communicate with, the, with their um, partner. I use the Talk Abroad free conversation templates. Uh, Talk Abroad is a vendor platform. I didn't use their platform, but they have these templates that help prepare students for a conversation with the native speaker. And the transcription activity was wonderful. They had all these wonderful reflection activities. And when the students went back to listen to their conversation, um, they could then um, pinpoint an, a part of the conversation where they had difficulty comprehending. And when they transcribed it, they often reported that they could understand much better after listening again and transcribing. Next slide. This is just uh, showing you some of the listening clips that the students had. The topic was talking about their favorite holidays and how they celebrated them as a child. And CORAL, the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning, um, they actually um, have a bunch of videos of native speakers uh, engaging in various topics. And this cuts off, I gave them about 10 different clips to listen to in anticipation of uh, talking about that topic with their, with their partner. Next slide. And then they had a speaking and writing activities. Um, for the um, speaking activities, I think I used VoiceThread last summer, the summer before I used SpeakPipe. And I made them write out questions. So if they got stuck with their partner, they could actually fall back on the questions that they wrote. Well, we're gonna have to skip the video, I think, Howie. Let's skip through the video and we'll go straight to the student's reflection. This, this is a reflection after a first conversation that the student in that uh, you saw his photo, Kevin. He was uh, training to be a, an ESOL teacher, but in his part of Georgia, there were a lot of Spanish speakers. So he was taking undergraduate Spanish classes to build up his Spanish language skills. So he said he was very nervous before and during the conversation. As an introvert, talking to someone new is difficult, regardless of the language. He struggled to speak and felt that there was a wall in his mind. So bringing up that Krashen's uh, effective filter. He distinctly remembered feeling so desperate 10 to 15 minutes into the conversation he wanted to hang up. During the conversation, he understood about half, 85% of what his partner said. But after listening to the recording, which he felt was painful, he understood 95%. So reflecting and listening back is so important. During this conversation, I felt like I was for dear life and going wherever the conversation took me. In the future, I want to use more of the questions I prepared and perhaps have a glass of wine. Only college students that are above, of age can do that. And I recommend no more than one. All right, next slide. And then to, cut, uh, to uh, cap off the course, I had the students engage in a digital storytelling project. I have two examples for you that I have uh, given Catherine this presentation so you can go back watch those. I think they're amazing. Um, the digital storytelling, they did, they had to interact with their, their language exchange partners to find out what is daily life like in Cadiz? What do people eat? What time do they eat? What do you do in your, in your free time? Of course, they researched the history, the culture, but they had a chance to learn about real life from their partner, and they created these beautiful digital stories. When you go back and watch them, the first one, I let them use whatever technology they know. If they don't know any, then I show them how to either use PowerPoint or Photo Story 3, which is a free download. Um, but if students are real tech savvy, I say, go for it. And if, when you go back and watch the first video, you're gonna think, oh my gosh, this, this student is killed. In the second video, I, I gave a low tech example to show you, it doesn't matter if it's low tech. The student still spoke Spanish. She still learned all about the culture from her partner and, and shared that in her digital story. So whether the student uses high tech or low, it doesn't really matter. We're gonna to have to advance because we've only got about a minute left. So let's go ahead and advance to the um, slide where I share about the conference. Uh, there's your resources. All the resources are here. Again, I shared this with Catherine. I thought an hour, I'll have so much time. Um, I want to invite everyone to come to our conference in Boston, 18th through 20th. It's going to be a hybrid conference this year. So you can either come in person, you can uh, 
participate online. And um, I think we have the next slide. Does it show our keynote speaker? I'm not sure if I have that slide here on our presentation for tomorrow. Our keynote speaker on Friday night is Chef Jose Andres. He's the uh, founder of World Central Kitchen. So excited. So I hope that all of you will be able to attend either virtually or in person. And I'll just, we're kind of out of time, but if there's a, a you know, question or two, I'll be happy to stick around and take those. Thank you for attending this evening. Sorry about the music.